Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanick with Figured Out Baseball. Got a great Figured Out Baseball podcast today. Uh, we're being joined by Ty Neal on the program. Ty is a, a guy with a tremendous amount of experience who's been around a lot of different levels and, a, and a, done a lot of different things in his career. So I'm excited to, to talk with him and excited for any listeners here, whether you're a player or a coach, to be able to learn from Coach Neal and learn through about uh, just the things that he's gone through and all the things that he's able to share with us. I'll give you a quick background on Coach Neal before we jump into questions with him. He's originally from West Elkton, Ohio. He played collegiately at Miami, Ohio, got his first job as a college baseball coach in the spring of 2000, where he was an assistant coach at Miami, Ohio, his alma mater, obviously. Then from 2001 through 2003, he was an assistant coach at Southern Illinois. While he was there, he coached the all-time strikeouts leader as the pitching coach. He then uh, spent the 2004 season as an assistant coach at Cincinnati, then the 2005 season back at Miami, Ohio. While he was at Miami, Ohio for this 2005 season, his team was top 10 nationally in ERA and also produced two big leaguers off that team. Pretty amazing for uh, a, a northern, what you I guess what you call a northern mid-major. Then from 2006 through 2013, spent a long time as an assistant coach at Indiana. Of course, a, a Big Ten program that when when the when he got to Indiana was not a lot of a track record of success not a lot of history at indiana but they really were able to turn things around there and i'm sure that'll be part of our discussion today his time at indiana culminated with a 2013 trip to the college world series while coaching in indiana coach neil also coached on the pitching staff coach the guy who ended up being the all-time leader as well as the guy who was number two all-time on the wins the individual wins list uh, leaderboard at the uh, in the history of the indiana baseball program He then went to Cincinnati, back to Cincinnati to be the head coach. He was there from the springs of 2014 through 17. He spent 2018 as a quality control analyst at Arizona State. Uh, Overall in his career, 18 years as a pitching coach and head coach, zero Tommy John surgeries among his pitchers. Uh, just a tremendous, unbelievable track record with pitcher, which pit, with pitchers that he's had. Uh, He's recruited and coached guys that, uh, that you would, you would recognize the names of Ian Happ, Kyle Schwarber, Sam Travis, Josh Fegley, Alex Dickerson, Aaron Sleggers, among others. Uh, Coach Neal, it's a it's a, a great resume to introduce you, and I'm I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. I appreciate you joining us today. I appreciate it, Jeff. I love to talk baseball with you. Usually, I like to start with something from the podcast that stands out. I think there are a lot of different areas we could touch on but honestly the first thing that i'd like to ask you about is in the the era where it seems like everybody is getting tommy john surgery it's like if you look around the big leagues and you find a guy who's been in the league long enough to be maybe in his late 20s early 30s he's had tommy john either through college or early in pro ball or whatever it's 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 it seems to be very rare that a guy doesn't have Tommy John at some point. What's the what's the secret? What's the magic formula that in your whole career, uh, you know, you never had a guy that had Tommy John surgery, and, and you were the pitching coach for, you know, for most of those teams. I'm sure even as the head coach, you were a, a, an influencer for the the pitching staff, and, and obviously you hired someone who you believed in in what their strategy was for the pitchers. How what's what's the secret here uh, for anybody that's listening, whether they're a whether they do coach pitchers, whether it's a high school head coach that is, is interested in the health, you know, of the arms on his program, or, or whether there's a young pitcher listening to this who obviously, you know, wants to stay healthy, can can you give us some some insight as to what you did exactly that worked? So you want the secret sauce? <laughs> uh, if you don't uh, mind, if you'll I'm share kidding. it, yes. I want the whole I'm all kidding. the ingredients. Uh, no, it, it, it's just one. It, it's it's relationships, right? Uh, I think it starts with a lot of communication with with your individual pitchers and your pitching staff. Um, I, I did a lot of trying, just asking these guys uh, to take ownership, right? Uh, ownership of their body, you know, ownership of their work ethic, ownership of their rest, of their, you know, just uh, a constant communication on how you're feeling today. Um, you know, a lot of that, you know, as a recruiting guy um, at the at the Division One level, you know, you're you're recruiting who you want, right? Um, so it's recruiting body types, it's recruiting arm actions that, that I I think are um, are going. 
point to stay healthy. Um, but then once you're getting those guys on campus, it, it goes back to that, that rapport with them, the communication. Um, I, I dove right in. I'm catching bullpens. Um, I'm in the weight room working out with them. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I've got daily contact with the athletic trainer, with the strength coach, with the academic, academic advisor. You know, that's where you're going to get your real information of, you know, who, you know, who's going to have a tough week ahead of them academically. Maybe they're getting a little less sleep because they've got a big test coming up that week. Um, you know, being in the weight room with the guys, grinding with them, lifting with them, going through the workouts. I know where I'm sore in, in certain areas after a workout, so I can help our, our pitchers maintain their bodies uh, after just going through it with them. Um, obviously, the athletic trainer. That's where all the that's where all the communication happens in a training room on a college campus. You know, just the rapport there, and, and really just. Uh, Knowing what these guys are up to uh, on a day-to-day basis, um, and, and then I think the, the main part, I, I think that I've always, I don't, I don't want to use the word separate myself, but uh, I, I do, I, I do think I, I was able to kind of separate myself from maybe some other pitching guys where I, I just had a really good feel and awareness of of the body and how the body's moving and. Um, you know, hey, this guy might need to, you know, do do this a little bit different um, to throw healthy. I always I always talk about we have to throw healthy before we can um, get the most out of our guys, right? So I was always put a big focus on how can we get this guy to throw as healthy as possible, and then the growth and the development starts happening, and then. You know, and, and then ultimately, you know, you'd mentioned the strikeout leaders and the all-time wins leaders that I've coached, and the, you know, you uh, left out the all-time saves leader in Indiana, which is okay, right? Two single season saves leaders, along all-time saves leader uh, Ryan Halstead, but just that's that's where the numbers happen, right? That's where the growth happens. Of hey, this guy can be the all-time wins leader in Indiana because he throws healthy throws healthy therefore he can pitch up you know every seventh day or if he's a bullpen guy those closers you know they can pitch and, and bounce back and uh, night one and then bounce back and pitch night two um but i think and I, I guess the final piece here is um i speak about pitching the contact so much um that that's always been my pitching philosophy uh, as, an, as an assistant and as a head coach. And I think the, the end result long-term of that is you guys tend to be more efficient, more efficient and they're throwing less pitches per start or they're throwing less pitches on, and that close opportunity. Um, and I, I think the end result of that is longevity. And, um, you know, and the, and the health. And uh, I just, I think I've had a, a, a bit of a knack for, for protecting my guys as well. Sometimes it's speaking up to a head coach of, hey, this guy, this guy's done today. He's, he, he's on the, you know, he needs to recover today. He's resting and recovering today. We can't use him. Um, and sometimes, or all the time, putting that, that young man's health way above um, for that day. Uh, just, just trying to tie all those things all into one. Uh, I think you have a 18 year career of, of not losing a guy. It's unbelievable. Um, what, what do you think are some of the primary causes or, or I should say, what, what are some of the most common causes of Tommy John for someone that's listening to this, that, that again, if I'm a head coach, me, Jeff Stanick, if I'm a head coach, my background's not in pitching. You know, if I'm if I'm interviewing a pitching guy or or whatever, I'm just kind of overseeing the pitching. What are some things that I should be maybe most concerned about? Is it is it pitch counts on a particular day? Is it rest between? Is it you know bad mechanics needing to get fixed? Like what what do you think, Ty, are some of the biggest causes of Tommy John, especially at the youth level? Because there you can read quite frequently the the number of kids that are getting Tommy John surgery in high school, and it's uh, you know even before they get to college. Uh, I think it's a couple of things. It's uh, one back to I, I, you got to learn how to throw healthy. 
arm, and what does that mean, right? Is that arm working? Is that body, is that lower half and that body allowing that arm to work so we can throw the ball efficiently, right, and um, and, and repeat it? Um, you know, are we throwing healthy? Um, two, which is, uh, I, I think that's, uh, I think it's, um, a disaster right now in youth sports, um, and probably even summer travel baseball. Um, it's just a lack of recovery. Um, and what does that mean? I, I, I think it's less about one setting, one uh, pitch count in one setting, right? Let's say, let's say you're starting your, you've got a 13 year old that's starting a game on Thursday of a summer tournament. Um, and he throws, you know, 80 pitches. Um, I I don't really, as long as he's throwing healthy and and he's ready to handle that workload, I don't, I don't see much wrong with that. But the issue is, is when he's being asked to bounce back on Saturday or Sunday and, uh, help that team win and that, you know, that big, that big game, uh, to get to the championship game. There, there lies the issue that, that 80, 80 pitches is pretty harmless unless you add on the back end of it, um, a, a, a more of a workload, uh, without the proper recovery of throwing those 80 pitches. And I use the example all the time. There is not one major league baseball pitcher or college pitcher that's starting on a Friday night and throwing 80 to 100 pitches and bouncing back. A day or two later, they're they're, just, they're not doing that now. You know, there's that fine. Maybe last weekend to, to get you know from that super regional to the college world series. Maybe, maybe, maybe once a season. But these these teenagers are doing it once a weekend, right? <laughs> uh, uh, every week, I'm sorry, every once a weekend, every weekend. So that's where it's starting to catch up to these guys. Um, so yeah, are, are we throwing healthy and we, are we being protected? Meaning, are we allowing our guys to recover properly? You mentioned something else that I want to talk about. If we can stay on pitching for a little while, that your philosophy pretty much for your whole career has been to pitch to contact, which yes. uh, seems like the opposite of what most people talk about. And, and I also want to bring up that you have coached some some guys and teams that have struck out a lot of people but but the goal uh if if you're saying you know the goal is to pitch to contact you're still striking out a lot of guys can you just talk about that to people who hear that term and really scoff at that they think that that's like 1980s stuff like you can't pitch to contact now especially if you want to be a draft pick or you want to play in college like as a as a high school player you can't pitch to contact because that's not what guys want to see but you're telling me on with some very very successful pitching staffs you've done that can you just talk about that to people who maybe hear that term and and just immediately are turned off by that um well i mean my initial reaction to that is you can't you can't get to strike three unless you get to, you, you got to get to strike one before you can ever think about getting to, to strike three, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I use the old adage, man, I, at all levels, you see guys trying to strike guys out on the first pitch. And what do I mean by that, right? And that first pitch fastball, you're seeing guys, they're, they're rearing back and throwing that thing as hard as they can, and they're missing up in the zone a little bit, hoping – Hoping to get a swing and a miss. I'm trying, I'm going to throw this fastball by this guy. And, you know, that's where, that's either a ball in the gap or the, the, the hitter takes it for ball one. Um, it, it just doesn't do us much good, right? Um, I think strategically, if the object is to take outs and, uh, you know, outscore your opponent, really that's how you win baseball games. Um, I, I just think there's, there's, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like the game's easy, but there's an easier way. You know, I, I use example all the time. What if, because that hitter, until they get to professional baseball, one, you're, you're facing an amateur hitter. And every, we've heard so many people talk about how hard hitting is, hitting a baseball, right? They say it's the hardest thing to do in sports. So why are we making it? so hard on the mound and um, 
So a lot of things can happen if we throw the ball in the strike zone on the first pitch to get that strike one. Here's all the different scenarios that could actually happen. One, he could take it for a strike, right? Um, two, he might foul it off. Um, three, he might hit a home run, right? Which, okay, so a home run's no picture, right? Um, he might hit the ball in the screws, and it might be a line drive right at your shortstop. You know, he's going to catch it. He might hit a ground ball. Team's got a chance to pick it up and throw it across. He might pop it up, right? There's so many. And if the hitter does everything right, the numbers tell us he's only going to get that first pitch. If he if he puts it in play, he's only going to have success three out of ten times. You know, so I, I I'm not a big I'm not a big you know sabermetrics analysis kind of guy, but. If you do, if you kind of look at it that way and you kind of do some simple math, it's like, why would I want to throw as many strikes as I could? Um, <laughs> I, I just, um, and, and then the other part of that that's being left out, I think, is how valuable a two seam fastball is, right? Or a BP fastball. We, uh, the, we used to call it BP meaning batting practice. Um, you know, what if you throw him a first pitch two seam fastball and, and if it's if it's a good, if it's a pitch that's doing what it should do, and at the college level, it's going to do that, right? Um, you know, throw that ball down the middle of the plate and let it work for you, right? He, he, he's by the time the guy sees the baseball, he starts his swing where he thinks he's going to barrel the ball up. A, two, a good two seam fastball, then you're going to get the bottom of the barrel, not the barrel. Um, we just rear back and throw the too many four seam fastballs, trying to throw the ball by. Here's the deal. If you throw the ball by the guy on the first pitch, he swings and misses. You know what you have to do again? You have to throw him another pitch. So then what? Now we're trying to, you know, the old adage, now now we're going to break the ball. Okay. Okay, what if he swings and misses? You know, you still have to throw him another pitch. Uh, what if he takes it? It's probably going to be a ball down. There's so many things that let's just simplify this pitching thing, especially at these amateur levels, and throw the ball over the plate and let you trust your defense. Um you know, Tracy Smith, I learned from him when I pitched for him in Miami, nine versus one mentality. There's nine guys on defense. There's one hitter. Hitting is extremely hard already. I think all nine of us can get this guy, right? Um, so just, it's just, and let me, let, let's, let's keep going. The umpire enjoys you more. The coaching staff and the dugout enjoys you more. The crowd enjoys you more. Your defense behind you. Uh, especially half the country, it's a little bit, the college level anyway, half the country, it's chilly every game anyway. Um, so let's just keep everybody on your side. Let's fill up the zone and, and see what happens. Um, so I just I, I just think it, it is that simple. Um, but it's not that simple to get your whole pitching staff to buy into that, right, and take ownership of that. That takes some time. And what it does is it, you need a couple of your better guys or your veteran pitchers to go out and do it. And then your younger guys start seeing, wow, this, is, this isn't so hard. Um, so, you know, it's contagious. It's one of those contagious things. Um, the other part of that is the other, the other way is contagious. Also, you get a guy out there and he's trying to throw over fastball by everybody, you know, burying breaking balls and high pitch count and walks and, you know, kind of that hit or miss guy. You know, that, that could potentially, uh, become the identity of your pitching staff also. And, and you know, that, that was never for me. I love that mentality. And as a, when I left college baseball and I was, um, I was a high school coach just for a year and I, I probably have talked about this on the podcast before, but I called pitches and, uh, I'll probably get some slack, some flack from that, but, uh, <laughs> but I called pitches. And I, and I taught, and I, I, and I, I have coached catchers in the past. So I was kind of coaching the catchers as well. And basically at the high school level, I instructed the catchers to set up, set up low and down the middle, uh, until, you know, in, in basically if you were ahead or behind in the count, you're setting up, I'm sorry, if you're even or behind in the count, we're setting up down the middle and, and, and we weren't allowed to go to the, uh, to the thirds of the plate, even until we were ahead in the count. 
and you had to be ahead either 0 and 2 or 1 and 2 to set up on on the black and uh and just with the mindset of with these pitchers like you said we're just we're going to trust our defense we're going to let guys roll the ball over uh we're going to get quick outs we're going to have fat, you know good innings we're, we have three outfielders that can really run at the high school level and we have infielders that can catch the ball on the ground and and it was amazing how guys bought into that the first time we talked about it it was like I was speaking another language to him, but by the end of the year, um, the guys really, really bought into it. And we struck out plenty of people, but what we didn't do is put a lot of guys on base for free. But I also presented guys with statistics about um, – I collected stats. You know, I've collected them in the past at the college level, and I did it at the high school level as well when I was there. But basically the – what a team averages – how many runs an inning a team averages scoring if you – give up a walk, a hit by pitcher, an error compared to an inning with none of those things. And and obviously the pitcher can control two of those. Um, and, and then also just the difference, as you know, the difference in batting average when you get ahead 0-1 compared to being behind 1-0. Uh, you know, what what's the difference in an inning when a leadoff guy gets on compared to when he's out? Um, and, and again, a pitcher can control certain number of, the, of those things, but certain things they can't. But when you, I think when you kind of present that whole body of work to people and all those statistics to kids, like they're smart enough to say to see like, all right, I can see how how there's a lot of benefit to doing this. So I'm going to give it a shot, and then they they have some success with it. And like like you were saying, that the more success you have, especially when a couple of your older guys have success with it, the rest of the guys can kind of run with it. So it's it's something I wish more people would buy into because. If you, if you buy into it as a young as a young guy as a young pitcher, I think that you're more likely to carry that mentality as you get older, and and vice yeah. versa. Then you end up with yeah. guys throwing 25 pitches on average in one inning, and it's a hard game to watch. It's a very hard game to play defense behind, and you're not going to pitch deep into a game. Correct. Yeah, I, I just think you know we, we've you know you get all these big leaguers that have you know they'll they'll throw out a a quote or a tweet or you know and I read something like. Uh, something about you know I, I one of these major league guys said i made it to the big leagues when i started trying to make the hitter hit the baseball instead of miss the baseball right <laughs> um, I, I think that's i think that's gold it's worth its weight in gold and again it, it takes I, I use the example all the time i try and stay somewhat in shape it's definitely in throwing shape right um you know i'll get up and throw a bullpen or you know get up and jumped in uh, throwing an inner squad game or you know not only that but catching bullpens but just as hands on and uh you know like a you know the occupational therapist mentality of hey i'm not gonna just sh- tell you how to do it i'm gonna try and jump in and show you right um i, I think that's important as a coach to, to be able to do that but uh, just getting out there on the mound with these guys and say all right Here's what you here's your here, here's what you have here's your rep, your repertoire. Um, let's stand up on that bump and say, tell yourself this: I'm going to stand on the mound. I'm going to throw this right hand. I'm a right handed pitcher. I'm a, I'm a former left handed pitcher, but you know you're normally talking to right handed pitchers because the world's right handed. And all right, and you're, you're normally facing right handed hitters because the world's right handed. So I'm going to stand on this mound. I'm going to throw my two seam fastball right down the middle of the plate. I'm going to have a little bit of arm side tilt, arm side run, if you will. It's going to run down and in a little bit to that uh, right hand hitter. And he's going to hit a ground ball to my shortstop. I think if you can, one, tell you, convince yourself that, tell yourself that, convince yourself that. Uh, and then, one, it takes the pressure off of you ex- uh, executing your pitch, it takes the pressure off of you of trying to hoping that the guy doesn't do anything with the pitch, right? It's, it's a positive, it's just a positive mindset. And it's crazy how many times that actually happens, right? Because these hitters, what else is that right hand hitter going to do with that pitch, right? What else can he do with it? Yeah. He might hit in the six hole, right? He might hit roll in the six hole for a single, but you know what? That next hitter's right handed also. And we get to keep our, left side of our infield intact. I'm going to do the same exact thing, first pitch to the next hitter. You know what the next hitter is going to do? He's, I'm not going to give up back-to-back singles. The next guy is going to roll. He's going to hit a ground ball on my third baseman or my shortstop, and we're going to get a double play. 
I've thrown two pitches and I have two outs, right? That's, we have to have those conversations every single day with our pitching staff until these guys start understanding that, yes, it is that simple. Um, and then just that, and then that creates that mindset and that confidence of pitching the contact, trusting your defense, the old ad, the old things that have been around forever, right? But it still holds true today. Um, you know, and we also, that also, this also allows us to, um, this conversation I had with, uh, with DJ, Derek Johnson, um, when he was a bandy and, um, uh, now obviously with the Reds, um, got to be able to plus and minus off that fastball. I mean, that's been around forever also. So if we're throwing that fastball the same speed every single time, four seamer, how are we going to plus and minus? How are we going to plus off of that? Right. How are we going to, how are we going to get, throw the ball by the guy 0 2 and we've slowed him down? Uh, we're not going to. And we're, he's seen the same speed every single time. So also allows us to kind of plus and minus. Um, anyway, I talk all the, this is, you know, it's it's what we should be talking. In my opinion, what what these these amateur pitchers need to be hearing on a daily basis. I, I'm not going to tell a pitching coach how to do their job, but I do know this is what amateur pitchers need to be hearing. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it just increases their confidence. They throw less pitches. They recover quicker. Back to your question about Tommy John. Yeah, you're hearing the recipe to keep these guys healthy, um, and you're also hearing a recipe of how to win, right? Um, so, I don't know. I just, uh, I use the language comfort zone fastball. And what does that mean? Comfort zone fastball. A comfort zone fastball is if you hop up in the bullpen right now, what speed are you throwing at? What speed do you have to settle in at to throw 8 out of 10 fastballs in the strike zone? Because you're going to naturally miss them. The amateurs are naturally going to miss a little bit. Right, eight out of ten times. How how many times can what at what speed can you throw your fastball in that comfort zone, right? And throw it over the plate, or throw it on this half the plate or that half the plate, eight out of ten times. And that's what for me, that's what strike one looks like. Hey, here now I have my command, right? I've got strike one here in my comfort zone. If you're a ninety mile an hour guy, would you be top out at ninety mile an hour? Your comfort zone fastball might be 86, 87, which, you know what, is plenty good enough. And then, all right, we get ahead of the guy. All right. Hey, now he's anticipating all speed, right? Okay, now I'll throw that 90-mile-an-hour fastball, maybe at the top of the zone uh, or, or in or whatever, and now you freeze him. Now he's not on time. Um, so, anyway, I use the word comfort zone. It's like driving. What, what, what speed, if you go around this turn, at what speed do you have to, you gotta, you gotta decelerate a little bit. At what speed do you have to decelerate to, to make sure you stay between the yellow and the white? And, um, you know, that's that comfort zone when you're driving. It's that comfort zone when you're pitching. And I think I'm not a hitting guy, but I spent 18 years trying to get hitters out. Um, actually more than that as a pitcher uh, myself. Um, I think you got to have a little bit of a comfort zone swing as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just think if we can continue these, if your guys are hearing this, they're going to start seeing results, um, and that's where the that's where the ownership happens. I agree. That's one hundred percent the same for hitters. I mean, anybody can go out there and swing as hard as you can every swing. And, and I don't want to, you know, we don't need to, to diverge onto the, the major league batting average thing, which, you know, is, is, uh, just a mess on social media right now, of course. <laughs> but, uh, you know, starting to turn around now that guys aren't allowed to use the sticky substances anymore all of a sudden. But, but with hitters, I mean, you could go out there and, and swing as hard as you can every swing and probably hit some homers, but probably also hit about a buck 85 or, you can take basically a comfort zone swing in majority of situations and barrel the ball up a lot more often and still hit some home runs, maybe not as many, but you're also going to hit a lot more singles, a lot more doubles. You're going to be a lot more productive and, and a lot more of a, of a, of a team player, you know, help your team to win a lot more games. That's certainly how I feel as a hitting coach. And it's, it's, it's just cool. Once you have a conversation with somebody, you just, there's so many, even if you don't know that much about pitching, there's a lot of things 
conceptually, especially that are very similar um, with hitters and pitchers, I believe. Mm-hmm. Now, Ty, think, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just think it, it goes back to mentality, right? It, it, you know, you, you could say, okay, baseball's a, a mental game, this and that. You talk about approach, you talk about it, it's right. I, I, I sum all that stuff up with mentality. My mentality, the ownership that I want my pitching staff to take, each individual pitcher and then eventually the pitching staff, um, is the mentality of we're going to pitch the contact or lay the count, which is going to get us into the zone, and that's how you get to strike two, right? You, back to you got to get strike one, strike two before you can put a guy away. All right, now, okay, now your stuff's good enough. Now we've kept you healthy, so you're a freshman. You know, you're 87. Now we've kept you healthy and on a throwing program, and you've worked your rear end off. Now you're old, now, old, now you're 90. Now we've kept you healthy at 90, and you know you're throwing a lot of strikes. And now that now that that stuff gets a little bit better. Now you're 92. Now the guys are having to cheat a little bit more uh, to get to your stuff. And you know that this is how it happens, right? It can't be 92 right out of the shoot. It's got to we got to kind of grow into that. And all right, now you've spent a year or two pitching the contact, taking your outs. Now you're turning into a man. Now, now that first pitch, two seam fastball is eating that hitter up a little bit. It's in the zone, but it's eating him up a little bit. And he don't know what to do with it, or he's fouling it off, or he's fouling it off his foot. Um, and now you blink, and now you're 0 2 1 2. All right, now we, start, now we start having to learn how to put hitters away. So we have to learn that as well. But all this stuff is a mentality of strike one. Pitch to contact. Oh, he didn't, he didn't do anything with that. Okay. Strike two, pitch to contact. Oh, he didn't do anything with that now, or that either. Okay. Now I start to learn how to, uh, you know, now, how am I going to use this breaking ball? Now, how am I going to execute? Now, now I can plus a little bit on this fastball. So it's just a mindset and a mentality that it has to be a daily discussion. It has to, there has to be proof that it's that it's happening and you know that that stuff oh, that that's how these guys turn into the all-time ones leader, the all-time strikeouts leader the all-time saves leader that i've had but that's also how they keep their health and and i know i'm talking in circles but there's really not much more to it than this um and the other i, I think to, to do it at a high level i think you have to have a keen eye on I think you have to have a, a mentality as a pitching coach to have a keen eye on, all right, how many pressure pitches did he throw last night? Um, it, 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 we're talking now maybe a bullpen guy. How many pressure pitches did he did he throw last night? Um, that starting pitcher, how many pressure pitches did he throw? Did he have to grind through his start? Um, okay, maybe we – maybe we. now my mentality is I'm in protection mode. I'm, I'm here to protect my guys to make sure they get – they get to that mound again. So now your mentality, um, it, it kind of, the, the player starts seeing it. All right, this guy really cares for me. This guy really wants to know how I feel. This guy really wants to protect me. And um, and then that's where they start trusting you more. Uh, anyway, I, th- this game is a mentality game. It's not It's not a numbers game. It's not a overanalyzed thing. It is a mentality game with a little bit of feel uh, of, of what's in front of you. And, um, I, I, golly, I, I can keep going on and on, uh, Jeff, but, um, I just think you have to have that mentality. You have to add some mentality to that. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, you're already kind of getting into the development side and that's really kind of where I wanted to go next. Um, and if I can just preface, and, and again, I, I'm on the outside looking in now. I, I'm not coaching anywhere, but I follow enough. I talk with enough guys. I see, again, what's happening on social media. You follow what's happening in pro ball and, and all that. And and, um, and now when you talk about pitch development, first picture in everybody's mind is velocity, and probably second picture in everybody's mind is spin rate, and that's development. If you're going to develop pitchers, if you're developing pitchers, that means you're developing velocity and spin rate. Like that's kind of the consensus, I think, around just the, the game at this point. 
But when you're talking about developing pitchers, like you're talking about some completely different stuff. So uh, let me just let me just ask this first. What what are you doing now, Ty? Are you are you working with any guys now? Are you still, uh, you know, are are you? I, I think you're a high school coach, if I'm not mistaken, right? Like, are, so are you working with young guys and still working on development? And if so, like, can you just talk about what development means to you exactly compared to what the perspective or, or the perception is in the game right now on developing pitchers? Uh, I mean, golly, that's a pretty broad question, but I'll, I'll yeah, I'm a, uh, as far as the development piece, but I'm a, I'm a high school coach at Loveland High School. Um, I actually just finished my master's degree um, in, in education. Uh, was was in the middle of that this past spring. I also uh, my oldest son is thirteen, so I've got a uh, it's SBP uh, serving baseball passion. Um, I've got a thirteen year old team that I'm I'm uh, dove right into, um, and, and we're playing this summer. Uh, a lot of a lot of practices, a lot of development, um, a lot of reps and touches, uh, skill skill work. Um, but playing in some tournaments this summer. I uh, also have 11 year old son on a team, and I've I've helped with them. Uh, but on this, you know, I, I guess it, here's the deal. Um, for me, it's that's what my mentality, right? My mindset, my mentality. It's all development. So. Uh, I, I do work with guys on the side. I met with a uh, young man yesterday that just graduated high school. Uh, he's hoping to walk on to a college program. Um, so I, I gave him, you know, day one, I gave him as much as I could to help prepare him for the college. I showed him a few things. He's an outfielder. Uh, showed him a few things. Uh, plan on meet with him next week. Again, um, I, I'm, I'll be with a junior college player next week. Um, in fact, there's probably uh, hopefully leading to uh, three or four guys that are uh, college guys that, that you know here, here being here in the Cincinnati area I've accessed some pretty good players and some pretty good resources um, but the other part of that is um, you know I, I plan to spend some time with some college guys next week and and just giving them everything I have to help hopefully hopefully they pick something up when they go back to campus they you know they're uh, uh, they're a better player, right? Better understanding of the game. Um, but as far as development, here, here's a, here's a perfect example, right? So I coached a high school baseball team this year, my first year coaching high school baseball. And we've got a catcher going to play uh, junior college baseball. And I told my team, I said, if we get in the first and third situations uh, this season, um, our catch, we're throwing through unless it's maybe the tie run or winning run, right? But innings one through six, we're throwing through. And for me, that's development, right? Because at some point every day when my high school catcher goes off and plays college baseball, he's going to need to be able to handle the baseball and execute a throw, right? Throw the ball to second base. And it might be when the tie run's standing on third, because that would be the winning run that's trying to steal. So, so unfortunately, kids aren't allowed throwing. Kids aren't allowed playing the game anymore, right? Catchers aren't allowed running the bases. Pitchers aren't allowed running the bases. Catchers aren't allowed throwing the second. Um, it, it's just, it's just crazy. So development to me is my senior catcher is going to throw the second as many times as he can because he's going off to play college baseball. Us giving up an extra run in this high school game is not. Well, either giving it up or not giving it up is not fair to him. He's going off to play college baseball. He needs to be ready. He needs as many game reps of throwing a guy out or, or, or handling the ball and putting a good throw, um, good internal clock, right? Um, that's the, the game owes that to him. I don't owe it to him. The game owes it to him. That's development for me. Um, learning how to, as silly as it sounds, um, with these pitchers, you know, back to what I said, just, Pitching the contact, managing the running game, um, and 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 here you go, Jeff. I, some people are going to think I'm crazy for this. I just coached high school baseball season. We didn't have any signs. Uh, I'm coaching. I'm coaching. A, I'm coaching a 13 new baseball team right now. Uh, we don't have signs. I don't call any pitches. I don't 
call any steals, hit and runs, bunts. I don't, I don't do any of that. Um, I didn't do it at the high school level either. Um, so what I want to do is to teach these in practice and have conversations on the bench in between innings. I want to teach these guys the game, and they need to take ownership of the game, and they need to learn how to make these decisions with conviction. They're using their they're using their 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 eyes, which creates instincts, awareness, and then you know that's how that's how they develop. And um, you know we owe it to the we we, we owe it to we owe it to the the sport of baseball to do that. And we definitely on to these end of players uh, on an individual basis. Um, you know, uh, Ryan, we need somebody to get to first base and, and get a one-way lead and let see this uh, pitcher's pickoff move. That's what this team needs. That's what we need right now. So somebody get to first base, get you a big one-way lead, and let's see this guy's pickoff move. Now we have all the information we need, and now we can work. And, um, and then, all right, now, there, there you go. You've seen his move. Now find a way to get to second base. That's what that's what the teaching that should be happening here at the, at the youth and high school level. So these guys, when I've seen, I saw it for eight for nineteen years. Fifty percent of the freshmen, I'm just throwing a random number. Fifty percent of the freshmen that get to college to a college campus, they 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 lose their freshman year because they're so overwhelmed with what's being taught to them or what's being asked of them, whether it be on, on the bases, whether it be throwing strikes, um, whether it be um, holding your ground on a stolen base attempt, right? These little things, um, whether it be a, the catcher being able to actually throw the ball to second base. Um, but there's 50% of freshmen I've seen over the 18 years, that they lose their freshman year that, because they don't know how to do these things. And um, that's back to, that's development for me. Let's get these guys ready for college baseball because this is the stuff that's going to be asked of them when they play college baseball. I, I don't think you could be more right about that. I, I talk to people about that quite frequently, and it's even happened to me, and it's probably happened in your in your tenure as well, that you even bring in a junior college player and the junior college player loses his junior year. And when, we, and when we're when people that are listening to this, when we're saying losing a year, we're not saying uh, a redshirt year or an injury. Right? We're, we're saying there's not really much development happening there because they're basically taking a year to play catch up and understand how the game works at this higher level. So essentially they're almost like deer in the headlights for the first year while they just – Take, you're right, they're spending the whole year like taking things in and trying to just catch up instead of being able to, you know, to fit right in and immediately start to to work on development and, and things like that because they understand all this stuff already. They're like I've had I'm thinking of one junior college player right now, a, a, a position player who really struggled his first year with us because the things we were doing offensively were so far over his head because they they didn't do anything like this in high school didn't do anything like this in junior college and not that we did anything that complicated but like we worked on hitting the ball to all fields we worked on situational hitting we worked on two strike approach you know we had different situations in a game uh you know we 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 base ran we actually had a plan on the bases whereas before they they didn't really have any there was no no um i guess a, a plan in a different situation just kind of Players just kind of ran as they saw fit. They didn't have a plan that this is what we're going to do in these types of situations, and they didn't work on it. And it took this one player that I'm thinking of now his whole junior year to really just get his head above water, and he kind of struggled that first year. But then his second year he had an unbelievable, like an all-conference, like tremendous numbers. He hit like 20-some, 20, 20 23 doubles, something like that, uh, uh, and, and hit well, hit, hit close to 400 and just had a, had a great year his second year with us, which was his senior year. And like, when you talk to him, it was just, he was a totally different player as far as his comfort level. And like, he got it. He, he finally figured it out. Whereas he could just go out and play the game and be his natural athletic, very talented self his second year. Whereas his first year, it was like, there were so many cogs spinning in his mind all the time that he just had a hard time just letting it go and playing. Information overload. For yes. These guys, right. Um, yes. Yeah, it's just I, I, they need to sl slowly. This information needs to be given to them at an early age, and then you know, 
hopefully, hopefully they hit the ground running. Um, you know, when, when the, they hit the ground running their first varsity season, and then you fast forward to college baseball, they hit the ground running. Um, you know, that first year of college baseball. Um, so you we- know, it's just yeah, it's uh, for me that's development. Um, you know, but it, it's moving right. It's moving healthy. It's uh, just just with the pitchers alone, I, I, I've had a pretty good knack back to the, the finer pieces of this development, right? I've always had a knack of just using my eyes and my instincts and have a feel for how the body works. And, you know, everyone's built a little differently, a little different bone structure, a little bit. Typically, it's a lot in the hips. Um, of the, I, I just think one of the, the things that's, that's – uh, overlooked the most or not not noticed the most I don't, I don't know the word i'm looking for the phrase i'm looking for but just so many teenage pitchers right and that includes a, an 18 19 year old freshman or sophomore in college they just they just they're not really sure how to keep their hips underneath them how to keep that center of gravity and really a, a, allow that arm to work and and repeat and I just think there's a little bit of misinformation given out, but I also think it's, um, you know, it's something that you get that adrenaline going and that heart rate going in the, in the heat of, uh, of the moment, heat of the battle. Um, I think those, those hips are usually the first to go. And if we're not seeing that as pitching guys, then, you know, I think that's that, that, that adds a lot to these young pitchers of, of, lack of command, lack of confidence, uh, and then you try and now you start that fight or flight. Now you want to fight your way out of it. So now you try and start throwing the ball harder and fight your way out of it. And and then you're, you know, you're, you're sweating and mad and upset and embarrassed. And, and now everything snowballs and now it's a big inning. And now we've thrown 25, 30 pitches in that inning. And it's just, I just see so much of that happening that um, I, I think I, I think if I think if you're a pitching coach, especially at the college level, you should be able to recognize those types of things and and help those guys. Um, and the last part of that is um, you'd ask about health and development and all that. I, I think too much is happening in the bullpen. Um, you know, if I were ever going to introduce something new or talk about something or work on something with any of my pitchers, um, it, it has to start. I use an old backyard, backyard toss. It has to start in the backyard. We have to be on the flat ground in the grass in the outfield, talking our way through it, starting at 45 feet, working back maybe to 60. Uh, and then they master that. Now we can start taking that to the bullpen. All right, now can you... How can you do that when, when that ground's disappearing underneath you, right? The, the slope of the mound where that ground started to disappear. Um, now, now, now can we do it here? Um, I've been, you know, pitching lessons here or there all, all my life, right? Even as a college coach, you're doing pitching lessons on the side. Every single person that's come to me for a pitching lesson, um, they look at me like I have three heads because we never get on the mound. I'm like no, we, pitching a pitching lesson isn't jumping on the mound and you you airing it out and me trying to tell you to try something new. Uh, a pitching lesson is hey, let's throw healthy, and then let's now now just jump on the mound and throw healthy, but like you've learned. Um, to me, that's what a that's what a pitching lesson is, right? Um, it starts with your throwing. It's just such a different mentality than you hear. You know, on a regular basis, and it's um, man. When I talk to good hitting guys or good pitching guys, they just have a way of saying things that that are so simple, and and just make sense. I, I don't know how else to say it. it. Just it, what like what you're saying right now makes makes total sense to me. And I I don't I love velocity as much as anybody, and I'm sure you do too. I love I love you know somebody who can really freaking spin a breaking ball or a slider, and I'm sure you do too. But that's not what we're talking about here, and it's it's awesome. I just I just like hearing guys who can say it so simply and and let it make sense to people uh, because there's so much noise out there that it's it's you get sucked into it and you you almost can't help but buy into it sometimes. Now, Ty, I want to ask you about just let's tie development into recruiting. When you're recruiting young pitchers, 
Like, what are some things that you that you like? Because the you know, I I just want to digress a little bit and say this right now, especially last year with COVID, right? Uh, most guys were recruiting watching video, uh, yeah. which is very hard to do. But you can see velocity and you can see spin rate because that's what these the companies that were that were holding tournaments and um and and live streaming them like they're putting those numbers up on the screen so you can okay you can see that guy's 63 and right-handed and you can see that he's throwing hard and you can see his spin rate and all that when you're recruiting going back to the development piece we just talked about do you care as much about velocity as the rest of the world does or are you more concerned with a guy who maybe shows uh, you know, what you talked about earlier, what it means to actually pitch. Like, would you rather see a guy with a little less velocity who, who looks like when you talk to them, when you talk to him, he's got the mentality of pitching to contact. I'm going to just, I'm going to try to pound the zone with my pitches. And when I get ahead, I know how to put guys away. Like, are you looking for that sort of advancement or is that something that or do you feel like you can teach that later? Whereas the other stuff you can't teach. I'm interested to know how the, you know, having that you talked about it, pitching being a mentality and, and you've you've talked about basically what you believe development means yeah. are those pieces that you that you worry about after you get the guy or are you looking to recruit the guy who's already got those in place and you're going to teach him you're going to sort sort of slowly ramp up the velocity over time and you're not really worried about the velocity piece because you feel confident that you can you can develop that like what what are you looking yeah. for when you're recruiting guys uh, well, are you talking to the 26-year-old Ty, the 32-year-old Ty, or the 40-year-old Ty, right? <laughs> it's part of your growth, and that's what I think coaches need to understand. You know, talking specifically to college coaches now, it's like, um, you know, I think I could write a book on the things that I, that I think we all could, right? We could write a book on the things that we've learned over the years. And, um, you know, so I, my, my young in my career, um, you know, work my, you know, when I was at Miami with, with, uh, with Skip, Skip is Tracy Smith. Um, and then my first couple of years in Indiana, um, you know, it, it was physical tools, physical tools, physical tools. That's all we talked about. You know, we need to get some guys in here with physical tools. When a physical tool for a pitcher is a good arm, right? Um, and body, and a body type. And so, I, I think I grew up a lot as a coach, as an assistant coach, um, just through trial and error, right? I, I think that's what's so beautiful about the sport of baseball and what's so beautiful about recruiting. But I'd say early on in my career, um, one, I was a pitching coach at the age of 22, uh, Division One. I just finished pitching in Miami, so my first year, I was 22, my, my first year as a, as a Division One pitching coach. and. Um, you know, playing the re- I was in a regional as a coach at the age of 22, um, with, with our Miami team, with coaching my former teammates. But my point in that is my, my growth, right? Growth and development as a, as a pitching guy, as a, as a recruiting guy. Um, I started off with Skip saying, we need arms, we need arms, we need arms. And I knew what that meant. We need physical tools, we need good arms. So I, I, I guess I did a little bit of both, right? My early in my career, I think I was guilty of um, wanting to please the head coach, wanting to, wanting to deliver the, this this really good arm, right? Um, so maybe maybe getting some guys early in my career with the physical tools, with the good arms that that I man I spent every waking hour once they got on campus trying to develop them, trying to change their mentality of, because they've been told their whole life they have a good arm, right? Sometimes when you're told your whole life you have a, you've had a good arm and your college coach recruiting, the guy recruiting you, the college coach tells you, we want you, hey, you have a really good arm, and all of a sudden you get to campus and you're like, wait a second, I've been told my whole life that I have a good arm and you told me I have a good arm, but now you want me to not try and throw the balls hard? Now you want me to pitch, right? Now you want me to locate my fastball versus throw it hard. So I, I think that's where we all can, can, can grow, right. Of, um, and develop as coaches. But so it kind of starts with, I, I, you have to have a philosophy, uh, as a, as a recruiting guy, a program has to have a philosophy. So my point now is now you fast forward 
later on in my time as a recruiting guy in Indiana, I think I was able to kind of mold both, right? Hey, we're, uh, hey Skip, I'm going to get you some good arms, but I'm going to get you guys some guys that can pitch a little bit and have some mentality to go with it, right? And you, and then all of a sudden, now you're in the college, and, and now all of a sudden, our eighth year, 2013, we're in the College World Series. So that was the evolution of me as a recruiting guy and a pitching guy of, hey, we've got good arms, but let's make sure we have – uh, strike one, right? Let's make sure we have a little movement. Let's make sure we can control our, our emotions and manage the running game. Um, you know, all those things that I, that, that I, I kind of hands on, thankfully, uh, Skip empowered me to make some mistakes. And I, you know, you hate saying the word mistake, but, but, but I do, you make mistakes all the time as a coach, uh, especially in recruiting. Um, and that's not a negative task. That's just it is what it is, right? Um, not every player is going to be who we hope they be. And uh, no, on the flip side too, you know, players get to campus. Every coach is not who these players think or hope they're going to be. So it's a learning process for all of us. But uh, yeah, just back to um, again, the 26 year old me is I'm going to get arms, and you know what, I'll. We'll worry about the other stuff later. Um, the the mid thirties, early thirties, Ty Neal, that was still a recruiting guy, but had a little bit of wisdom under his belt. Is getting a little bit of both. Um, you know, taking a risk here or there on a on a good arm, but also making sure we have plenty of guys uh, that are going to come in as, as strike throwers. Um, and then now you fast forward to the Ty that's been a head coach, um, and it's. Hey, I want dependable guys. And what does, what does dependable mean? This guy's gonna, this guy's gonna throw, he's gonna show up every day and work his rear end off, right? He's definitely gonna be able to throw strike one. Um, two, um, what does it look like? What does his stuff, what is his mentality with a runner at third and one out? Now I think I can skin it start peeling it back even more, right? What does that stuff, what is that heart rate doing, and what is this stuff doing with a runner third with one out? Because I remember to this day when I was at IU as a, as a pitching coach, I fell in love with a left-handed pitcher, right? Body, arm action, um, athlete, football player, all of the above, right? Love athletes, loves left-handed. He was 6'4", fastball played, he could spin a breaking ball, but if I go back to that day I watched him pitch um, in his uh, one of his final high school games of his junior year, man, he, he buried two balls with a runner third with one out when the game was on the line. Um, and what I mean burying, they weren't 0-2 breaking balls, right? He buried a fastball with a runner third with one out and that was nerves. Right. I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I couldn't get past all the other things that I fell in love with, but that was nerves right there. And when he gets to campus, we dealt with his nerves, right? We dealt with a guy. Now, now the, now, now we've got higher stakes here. Now it's every pitch he throws is extremely important because it's college baseball. It's our livelihood. It's, it's the Big Ten, right? Uh, we're a power five school. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're playing a quality schedule. We're, we're trying to compete. But now, higher stakes for him. He walked in overwhelmed, back to the one of those guys. He, he, he basically didn't offer anything his freshman year, but, you know, and then after a while, he gets, you know, he gets his legs underneath him. But still, now it's a sophomore in your program. He's not able to make a big pitch when you need it. Um, so, that's what the 44 year old Ty Neal would say now. It's like, let's, let's, let's make sure we check all of the boxes and not two out of four or only three out of four. And let's not leave out that mentality piece. That is so, that's the, that competitive spirit mentality. That's the, that is the hardest thing to teach. Um, it's not hard to teach. It's the hardest thing to, for them to, to, I guess, get that ownership of. It's not that they don't want to. It's just um, some, some,
some guys just aren't um, able to, to, if you want to call it rise or, or, or compete at that high level uh, emotionally, right? The emotion, I should say, the emotional piece. Not everybody can can execute at a high level emotionally. Um, so, um, but to keep it to, to simplify it, uh, does does this guy have a feel for his body, right? Can he repeat his his body? Does he have any aptitude, right? Uh, is he making pitch to pitch adjustments? Is he making game to game adjustments? Sometimes that's not real easy to see in the in the recruiting process. So um, you know that's where we have to be as thorough as we can. Um, but it starts with the philosophy. You have to have philosophy. Otherwise, you're chasing your tail. If you had to, if you were at a, a level outside the Big Ten where you couldn't, you had well, you you really, I, I think outside of the power five type levels you're you have a very hard time getting a guy that checks every box that you want if you had to leave one or two boxes unchecked tie that you felt like you could develop once they got to campus between um you know whether it was a guy who just wasn't very physical maybe maybe it was kind of taller but was was you know needed to put weight on to just uh, or needed to get stronger just to even to maintain his health, to be durable, whether it was somebody who didn't quite have the velo, whether it was somebody who didn't quite have the secondary pitches yet, whether it was um, – or whether it's the guy that just doesn't have the mentality, but maybe you think, well, maybe he's never been taught it. Maybe if I just – if we just tell him about it and he sees it work with other guys, he'll get it. Like if you had to leave one or two boxes unchecked, uh, are there some that you would continue you you would uh, consistently leave unchecked, or do you think that it is like you've got to talk to the kid and find out what he's been through, what he's been taught, and then sort of make a decision of whether or you know whether or not you think you can develop this part of his game, or whether he's already kind of aware of this? And I, I'll just to give you an, just to put an example out there to listeners, like if you if you have a kid who has been taught some different things mentality wise than what you're going to teach. Do you think that's something that, that just a couple conversations in a year of watching his teammates be successful, you can you can flip his mentality, or or do you think that's something that's a lot harder to do, um, you know, as opposed to somebody who maybe uh, it, maybe they're already trying to do it, but they you see that they just maybe don't have the uh, the intestinal fortitude to make the big pitch or, or whatever it is. Are, are, are there any boxes that you feel pretty confident that if this is, if this one's unchecked, I think I can check it over time for this guy to really be a well-rounded guy. Who's going to be one of the, you know, one of the dudes in our rotation later. I, I think the box that I've always, uh, again, the, the mid thirties and above, I'm going back to my own past, right? The mid thirties where I've got a little bit extra wisdom and experience and, trial and error i think the mid 30s to the to the guy i am now i think the box i would always leave unchecked is the velocity box um and that's where though back to your philosophy back to philosophy you have to have a philosophy i've i always had a pitching staff whether in indiana uh was skip skip giving me the uh, empowering me and the autonomy to to to, to just go right and, and and get our guys um I feel like with my recruiting philosophy, I was able to leave that velocity box unchecked because I recruited 6'3", six, 6'4", six, right-handed pitchers and above, and their arm and their arm works, right? You know, that's a broad term, arm works, but, um, but you know, efficient arm action, it works, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, just more, if you want to use the word pro- projection, right? Typically those guys, if they're throwing 85 in high school and everyone's lo- overlooking them because they're not showing the numbers and, you know, they're checking it, but they're checking the other boxes. Hey, he's a strike thrower. He, he works hard. Um, he's conscientious. He wants it. Um, he competes, right? Well, now those are the guys who blank by the time they're sophomores, they are throwing 90. 91, 92 mile an hour, right? Just by being in a structure. Maybe they're multi-sport athletes. Now they're in a structured environment. They're learning how to work. Um, maybe we're tight. Maybe we're strengthening the core or, you know, just that the long toss, just the structured program. Um, I, I would leave that unchecked. And then the other part of this, we've left. 
up. We've, we've totally avoided this part, but I'll let you in on another little secret. Um, is, is left-handed pitching. Um, <laughs> you look at all the pitching staffs that I've had, um, Indiana, you see, um, you know, we're, we're, we've got, we've got five, we're five or six deep with left-handed pitchers. And, um, you know, that, that's going to allow you to, it, that takes the pressure off of you with finding all those velo right-handed guys, right? Um, and it also takes the pressure off of you going and finding velo. Um, because left-handers, left-handers that, that, that can, I'll just say command the zone, uh, to their arm side of the plate. We all, that's where that's where we can dive deeper into the human body. We all naturally gonna miss arm side when we throw a baseball or we're all naturally gonna pronate as we're throwing and after we throw a baseball. So well if, if wait a second, if hitting's already hard and the world's right handed and us as pitchers we're always gonna all naturally pronate, well why wouldn't I and and hitters Amateur hitters are all going to handle pitches middle to middle end because that's all they ever work on. So why wouldn't I just kind of use a little common sense here and go and say, you know what? I'm going to make sure I have a handful of left-handed pitchers. I'm going to, if they don't already know how, I'm going to teach them a two-seam fastball and we're going to throw the ball out on the middle of the plate and we're going to let that ball leak a little bit arm side run to our arm side and run that ball away a little bit from these right-handed hitters, and we're just going to let them get themselves out. Oh, and by the way, because these guys aren't learning how to run the bases in high school, now they get to college, a left-handed pitcher neutralizes the running game. A runner at first base, even at the college level, instantly they get spooked just because that pitcher is now looking at them. They don't know how to handle left-handed pitchers. Um so, and, and that one guy in that lineup that could really do damage that you're facing is a left-handed hitter, or he's that speedy left-handed leadoff guy that makes their offense go. One of the two is going to happen, right? And, and, and the good college programs, they have the speedy left-handed hitter leadoff guy that wreaks havoc on your defense and on the bases. And then they've, that three- or four-hole guy is the guy that is the best hitter in the conference, or he's the guy that can change the game with one swing. We just neutralize their, their, how they go offensively also because that left-handed hitter has faced the right hand. The world's right-handed, so that left-handed hitter that's given everyone else fits, our left-handed pitcher neutralizes them, not because he's got nasty stuff, but because left-handed hitters don't see left-handed pitchers. Um, so anyway, I, I just – it's a little bit of everything. Um, but the velocity is, is less important for me. Uh, here's, here, here's a story for you, right? Eric Burnett, right? High school guy out of Ohio. He was in our first recruiting class in Indiana. Football player, physical, 6'3", lanky. He's 90. He's 90, 89, 91. Um, you know, is a little bit in high school. He gets there his freshman year. He's kind of the same guy, but that fight or flight, right? He's the guy that the, the stuff started flattening out when adversity struck, right? And I'm watching him one day in his bullpen from behind, and I'm. This is where I think we have to have a little feel as as, as, as pitching guys. And I'm thinking, man, those fingers are really getting on the side of the baseball here. Well, he's he's six three and kind of a low three quarter guy, and the fingers are getting on the side of the baseball, and that's a pretty flat visible, hittable fastball. I didn't get to this until the middle of his sophomore year. Now you fast forward to his junior year. Um, or let me back up. I said one day in the bullpen, and, and if we all stand here, our, our thumb, if you think about your thumb, right, your thumb naturally is kind of off to the side. It's not, it doesn't sit directly below your, your fingers, right? We have to kind of, so I, 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 so I, if we naturally all just kind of look at our hand and turn our thumb, if you look at your right thumb and you kind of turn it uh, from eight o'clock to six o'clock, right? That changes your fingers on t also. So now you put a ball in your hand. And I, I, my point in that is I said, Hey, let's, 
let's get your thumb underneath the ball just a little bit more. And what that did is it naturally turned his hand. It took his fingers from 1 o'clock to 12 o'clock. All of a sudden, he started throwing, he's throwing a fastball where his fingers are on top of the ball now. And, and it was a strategy just that I, I it was an experiment, right? So now, all of a sudden, now he's throwing the ball. Now he's 6'3", throwing the ball. Didn't really change his arm slot. But now his fingers are on top. Now that two-seamer just absolutely is exploding on guys. All of a sudden, that slider's disappearing. And then, funny story here is Coach Crane's first year at IU with basketball, he inherited a little bit of a mess, and they didn't have they didn't have enough bodies for their basketball program. So, uh, story a lot of people don't know, but Eric Garnett and one of our other players, Kip Schutz, uh, they were both juniors that year. Um, they joined the basketball program over the winter. Kip got to play a little bit, but Eric Garnett was. They used him as an extra body post player for to make their their players better in practice. But with that, over the winter, they were lifting four days a week because he was a post guy. So now you get this guy. All of a sudden, his fingers are on top of the ball. He's 89, 92. His fingers are on top of the ball now. Now he put on 20 pounds of strength, good strength, athletic strength. He goes out his uh, he goes out spring of his junior year. He's 95 to 97 with a wipeout slider, and he's a uh, Big Ten pitcher of the year and a first round draft pick. Wow! Right. <laughs> so my point in that is back to the body types and the, and then adding a little bit of awareness and feel to you know make that just that slight adjustment. Um, you know, instantly is his, his confidence increased, right? So. Anyway, just those little things that, that, that I've, you know, I, I've been able to do, right? Um, you know, Aaron Slager's big leaguer right now. Um, a kid from Arizona uh, was 6'8", and he was always dealing with growth plate issues, and he sent us a video, and it was 84. And, but it was, it was 6'8", 84, and downhill on strikes. And I looked at Skip, and I said, why wouldn't we take this guy? So we said, all right, come on. And then now you all of a sudden you had a structured program, um, you know, uh, just just all of the above that you get in these college programs. Um, now he's six ten, and he was the next Big Ten pitcher of the year that I had, um, and this is a Stoma Hall, and now he's a big leaguer. Um, so I, I think we have to be creative with with this stuff, right? And give and and, and here's the here's the deal. Baseball is a is a sport, uh, a game of opportunity. Um, we have so many opportunities through baseball, um, and you know those two young men were uh, one. They they jumped all over an opportunity, and they put you know, but they worked their rear ends off and and, and earned everything they got. So um, I don't know. I, I, there's all kinds of stories like that, but but it was for me. It was recruiting. Arm action and body types, and, and and then just having some patience with these guys, being diligent with them, and believing in them, and um, you know, just just some patience and mother nature and a work ethic, and um, you know, the, and then sprinkle some left-handed pitchers in around them, and I think that's a pretty good recipe. This is awesome. This is Ty Neal, everybody. <laughs> he spent 18 years as a college coach. Uh, at, at very high levels of baseball and, and Ty, before we let you go, I, I, you know, I say that you've spent 18 years as a college coach and now you're, you've been out of the college game for a couple years. What's next for you? I mean, do you, do you plan on getting back in? Are you liking where you are now and thinking you'll stay, uh, outside of the college ranks for a little bit? Do you, do you have any, any idea, any projection, just what you think you might want to do? Uh, yeah, I'm a college baseball guy. Uh, it's for me it's a matter of time for and my family my wife is awesome very supportive i've got the, my our three kids we're, we're a college baseball family um we've been uh loyal to the game we love the game we love the sport um i'm gonna be i'm gonna be back in um i think you and i were talking offline at one point but um you know you said a projection uh five years from now i'm uh I'm mentoring a whichever program I'm representing, um, but I'm mentoring the, the pitcher, whichever conference they're in. I, I'm mentoring the, the pitcher of the year in that conference, um, help, helping him prepare for professional baseball. And we just uh, 
wrapped up a championship. Uh, that, that's that's my projection. Um, it, it's who I am. It's it's what I love to do. It's what I'm doing now. I'm still helping develop these guys. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to to roll my sleeves up and uh, get back to it. That's awesome, and and I would look forward to seeing you back out there. For all the baseball people out there who know Ty, uh, I'm I'm sure that uh, that you're excited to see him back on a college field as well. You know, I I look at it like you know, their college baseball will be better when you're back uh, in a college uniform and, and and mentoring young pitchers again. And uh, so I'm excited to see that happen. And Ty, I sincerely appreciate the time you gave us on the podcast today and all we talked about. There's certainly a lot of stuff that. I wanted to cover that we didn't, uh, that we might have to schedule a second one of these, but what we talked about today, man, was awesome for anybody that listened to this. I think there's a lot of stuff to, to get from this and the, and the podcasts we record are, are such a great supplement to the videos. You know, of course the videos, they, we kind of, we cover a lot of stuff in the videos, a, a lot of drills and things like that, but there's stuff that we cover in these podcasts that you just can't cover in a, in a five minute video. So, so Ty, this has been really great. I I'm really thankful for your time and, uh, and appreciate you just sharing all the wisdom and, and, uh, you know, all the things you've learned over the years with all of our listeners today. Jeff, thank you. Uh, appreciate what you're doing for, for, for the game. It's awesome. I, I, um, I'm grateful, uh, and honored to be a part of it. Thank you for your time.